a folding chair, an easy chair, or a director's chair for Indian philosophy, with a question mark. An examination of the views of Wilhelm Halfas and Johannes Bronckhorst. <coughs> now, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. I am particularly appreciative of the work uh, Dan Arnold, Dwey Pai and Sain, Brian Ashby, uh, and Sally Noble have put in to make this uh, visit possible. It has also been my pleasure to meet uh, several old friends here. I speak to you with uh, some trepidation. I have met so many knowledgeable and bright persons, students and faculty from this university, that I'm not sure I can outsmart them, even to the extent of meeting the expectation that is naturally made of a visiting speaker, namely that he or she will have something new to say. I am apprehensive about the outcome. In fact, I am surprised that President Bush has not cited you folks at the University of Chicago as a source of intellectual terrorism. <laughs> Perhaps the word intellectual eluded comprehension at the White House. <coughs> the title of my lecture is long. I am not known for long titles. So you should give me the benefit of the possibility that I was not trying to fill time through a long title. Actually, I'm accommodating three separate essays that will become three parts of a longer essay under the given title. The three essays do not correspond to the three chairs in a respectively or yathasankhya type of construction. They jointly engage themselves as metaphors with the role Indian philosophy may be fated to play. What we then have on our hands is a situation that is met with in the case of folding chairs, easy chairs, and movie director's chairs. As summer arrives, Americans and their European counterparts take the folding chairs out of their storage areas. They use them for sitting out in the garden or on the beach for a few days and then go back the chairs to where they were. For some Western academic departments, Indian philosophy is similarly a matter of occasional use. One appoints someone knowledgeable about it, or one uses it as a tool for comparison if fortuitous circumstances allow one to do so. Some other department at the university appoints someone capable of saying something about Indian philosophy and the Department of Philosophy uses his or her services until it does not cost anything or does not cost much to use them. Indian philosophy is no intrinsic, entirely self-sustained value for the Department of Philosophy or the university housing it. Its utility is subject to weather permitting. Then there are other philosophy departments which work under the impression that early Hegel has determined the true worth of Indian philosophy forever. His pronouncement is like a Veda injunction to them. Most of them even do not realize that his, in his posthumously published writings, Hegel softened his position considerably and his generalizations about Indian philosophical tradition became more qualified. For them, Indian philosophy represents an era of easy chair philosophizing a time in which one just speculated and expressed opinions, but did not get up and, actu uh, and actually count the horse's teeth. The idea of person did not develop, uh, according to Hegel, in India. Systems remained fixed on substance. This kind of view is very commonly known in uh, several philosophy departments. It's not examined repeatedly, as it should have been. <coughs> Like the work of anyone who does it only if he or she easily can, Indian philosophy is passe for these departments. It has been superseded forever in the global history of philosophy, especially when the linguistic turn in philosophy has taken place and philosophers are coming close to psychologists and experimental scientists in their investigation of notions such as consciousness, time, or origin of the universe. Then finally, we have, especially in India, some voicing the opinion that Indian philosophy 
especially in its yoga and Advaita Vedanta forms, deserves to take the movie director's chair. Just as in the production of a feature film, the director is the boss, he gets to rise above the set, the, camera, uh, the cameraman focuses the camera where and how he wants it. His word on the script can be challenged perhaps only by the producer or the financier of the movie. In the same way, the course of future human knowledge ought to be directed by what the sages of Indian philosophy discovered through extraordinary cultivation of the body and mind. Mere exercises of the intellect for which the academicians are paid have gone too far. Their claims of total objectivity increasingly ring false. Laboratory-based science now ought to recognize its limitations or reconcile its theories with what the best of yogin's experience or texts of monism express. A time to hand over the matters to an integrated dichotomy, uh, dichotomy transcending and traditionally proven life of, uh, line of thinking has arrived according to this third group of thinkers. There must be some justification for the last attitude. Although it comes across as chauvinistic and is most commonly articulated badly and baldly by individuals who have little direct or in-depth in knowledge of Western societies. By restricting true or hard philosophy only to certain issues and by espousing a rather narrow version of science, true science is only that which can be tested in the laboratories, Recent Western philosophy, especially the Anglo-American brand of it, has indeed made even some knowledgeable and well-meaning persons ask the question, what is all this, why is all this being done? The relatively recent confluence of philosophy, psychology and linguistics in consciousness studies, etc., is welcome. But it is also a sign of the inadequacy of the earlier dominant approach that not all philosophers embrace that approach and not all philosophy departments banish the study of aesthetics, ethics, etc., or of thinkers like William James, and that schools like phenomenology and existentialism did come into being is also a proof of the incompleteness of the dominant approach of the last half of the 20th century. One can make the preceding director's chair kind of justification of Indian philosophy easier to swallow by turning it into a statement that has been recently, be, uh, that has recently been made to defend the teaching of Sanskrit, classical languages, etc. The Indian tradition is a vast ocean of human experience. It is the duty of educators, especially of educators at the universities, the highest level of delivering education created to ensure the give and take of knowledge at the international level, that the students and through them the future global village benefits from knowing about as much human experience as they or it can. I need not expand upon this last point. Personally, I consider it to be inarguable. So let me state how much, sorry, how one can make this claim of director's chair status for Indian philosophy in a different sense. This sense too runs uh, the risk of being characterized as chauvinistic approach, but when followed by well-informed and objectivity-oriented scholars, it may not be accused of being anything more than a tit-for-tat act or as an act of paying in the same coin. It goes like this. Historically, the Indian philosophical tradition is an older surviving philosophical tradition than the Greek or is at least as old as the Greek. It gives us a pure philosophy as the Greek, albeit the pure philosophy is differently situated. The mix may be different, but the crux is there. It is this sense or approach that I wish to mainly follow in today's presentation. There are two reasons for this decision. When Dan Arnold approached me on 20th May 2006 for the talk in the South Asia seminar, he wrote, I have been thinking to some extent of a theme on the order of studying Indian philosophy as philosophy, that is, thoughts on the value, limits, problems, etc., in taking Indian philosophers seriously as making a claim upon uh, us as philosophers. Um, 
recently I was given a list of the topics that have been discussed in this academic year South Asia seminar at your university. I noticed that all my predecessors have been wise enough to avail themselves of the second option Dan kindly gave them, namely talk on whatever you wish, as long as it's philosophical. <clears throat> I have a tendency to rush in where the wise fear to trade. On the rare occasions in which I agree to participate in a theme-oriented conference or series of talk, uh, talks, I cannot always resist the temptation of hitting the theme head on, although I am aware of the value of taking further our knowledge of specific smaller areas falling under the theme, that is of painting a corner expertly as others work on other corners, of contributing to the theme taxonomically rather than by embracing the tree itself, by acting like a member of the Chipko movement in India, you know, where trees were embraced with respect to the theme. So do doing, I do sometimes get stumped because of having too wide an area to deal with, having too many books or articles to read before I complete my project, but I did not worry too much about this possibility even be before getting into my tenure and why should I worry now, I'm retired. Okay. <coughs> <clears throat> Let me give you some idea of the approach I have taken in the two first, uh, first two parts, uh, which I'm not going to present today. <clears throat> Something along the lines of Dan's thinking was brewing in my mind for a long time. The first part of it appeared in an introductory essay on Indian philosophy I wrote for the South Asia Supplementation Volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica. There, among other things, I dealt with misconceptions or charges such as the following. A, there is no pure philosophy in India. Its thinkers are not thoroughly rational. They are not shy of appealing to extraordinary states uh, that most persons do not reach or cannot possibly reach. They also entertain the possibility of faith-dependent beings such as God. B, all Indian philosophy is practically oriented. There is no knowledge for the sake of knowledge stands behind it. It does not come into existence without a consideration of what one will gain with it. C, there is no academism in the way Indian philosophers think. When they write, they write out, out of personal conviction. The views they establish or defend in their writings are the views they follow in their own lives. The second serving of my three-part brewing on this topic took place in a paper I read at a World Sanskrit conference held in Delhi in April 2003. Since the emphasis of the conference was going to be on Sanskrit's contribution to the world, I mainly considered what we can do to enable Sanskrit philosophy, which for all practical purposes is synonymous with Indian philosophy, to gain its rightful place in global traditions of doing philosophy. It is at that time that I first thought of the chair's analogy. I hope to be able to send this final version of the Delhi paper for publication sometime this year. The principal aim of today's presentation, a third serving of my thinking, connects it with the preceding two and also seeks to meet the expectation expressed in the first part of Dan's email of invitation. The presentation will be more academic and historical in nature, but not so detailed as to make it intractable for non-specialists. In the first two say servings, although some of the details of my argumentation were new, I was mostly improving the treatment of the Indian philosophy issue. In them, I concentrated on delineating how Indian philosophy is treated like folding chairs or easy chairs, what the causes for such treatment are, and how the causes can be removed. Today, I will make a case, as I have already indicated, for Indian philosophy, putting Indian philosophy in the director's chair. In the present state of the world, to make such a case with the future in mind will be quixotic, in addition to possibly being seen as chauvinistic. Indian philosophy will not be guiding the development of philosophy, at least in the foreseeable future. Nor am I pining for it to do so, for I attach no value to labels based directly or indirectly on the notion of nation. 
I will have only the philosophy historian's mind as the presumed stage for my remark, remarks. There too, I am not going to say that some kind of Krishna of Indian philosophy be exclusively placed in the driver's seat of the chariot of philosophy when the history of the discipline is written. I would not mind a ride co-shared with Greek philosophy if that is where the evidence surely leads or if that is what the evidence make, uh, makes look more probable. My focus therefore will be on demonstrating why some scholarly writing done with the presupposition the, uh, of the primacy of Greek philosophy has been proved as neither conclusive or entirely sound. In demonstrating what I have in mind, I will, in the interest of time, simply refer to other results of my studies uh, on, or thinking. Some of them may be subjected to a critique in the discussion period. I will welcome the critique, but reserve the right of saying, please wait until my writing on the topic comes out or until my thinking uh, takes a well-defined shape. In the limitation I have placed on, upon myself, I will first discuss some of the comments made by the late Professor Wilhelm Halpfass in his outstanding and justifiably influential book, India and Europe, and later come to what my good friend, Professor Johannes Bronco, says uh, in his essay with the provocative title, Why is there philosophy in India? Available also in a French version. After stating the consensus view that philosophy began in ancient Greece with Thales, at the dawn of the emergence of reason from the limbs of mythology and folklore, Halfas, a rare and excellent scholar of both Greek and Indian branches of philosophy, notes, the Greeks themselves asked the question concerning the originality of their way of thinking and the possibility of their own traditions having oriental roots. Then he refers to uh, a doctoral dissertation by one F. Schaeffer done in, 18, uh, in, in late 19th century, where Schaeffer says that the doctrine of the ori oriental origin of Greek philosophy could also be found in the thought of the Greeks themselves independently of the claims of extra Greek circles. Neither Schaeffer's nor any other authors who wrote on this subject, this is Halfa speaking, neither Schaeffer nor any other authors who wrote on this subject have been able to produce unambiguous testimony from classical times which places the origin of philosophy wholly in the Orient, although manifold forms of wisdom as well as the development of important skills and insights may have been attributed to the Orient from the earliest days. The relationship between Greek thought and the world outside of Greece, the Orient, is marked by a particular ambivalence. It is precisely the openness for the possibility of alien sources, the readiness to learn and the awareness of such readiness which sustains the Greek claim of being different from the Orient." End of quotation from Halfas. Halfas's statement is highly informed in terms of the research done on the issue. It is dispassionate and, as we will see later, makes a much more nuanced use of the Greek tradition than Bronckhorst. We should note that Halfas does not pronounce a verdict. He keeps both the possibilities, Greek philosophy in its origin and initial stages being inspired by the or Oriental, in this context particularly Egyptian and Indian cultures and it is not being so inspired. He keeps both the possibilities open. He indicates that Greek openness makes the choice difficult. I feel that Halfas should have gone ahead, should have been more daring and at least consider where the probability was likely to lie in the present state of our knowledge. In linguistics, if a word or grammatical feature receives corroboration in more than one tradition, we rightly think of it as coming from an older stratum of the language family concerned. In mythology, we adopt the same principles suitably modified. 
Law also assigns greater truth value to content independently corroborated by more than one tradition or source. If the Greeks themselves, in an age in which nationalism based on a nation state in its political sense was fortunately absent, retained traces of being led to the notion or discipline of philosophy, we do not, in the first place, have any strong justification to question the veracity of what they were saying. If we, understandably again, take the position that every statement in our historical sources should be scrutinized, it should not be treated as sacrosanct. We have corroboration from the extra-Greek circles according to Schaeffer summarized by Halfas. I do not think it would have been unjustifiable for Halfas to show some openness to Schaeffer. He should have asked, how far is it likely that a community would think as the Greeks did in the matter of origin of philosophy unless it, that is the community, had at least a myth pointing in the direction of a possible borrowing or influence. Are all themes or central components of myths, even the commonsensical ones, entirely devoid of some kernel of historical truth? Is the delimiting of the Orient to Egypt in this context, no, uh, is the delimiting of the Orient of Egypt, oh, sorry, uh, is the delimiting of the Orient to Egypt in this context not arbitrary or at best just one speculation among two or more that may be possible? Is it not significant that the tradition of being indebted to the Orient continues for centuries among the Greeks? Halfas himself records that Megasthenes tells us that the Brahmins, just like the Jews, already know, already knew all those doctrines concerning nature which were subsequently taught by the Greeks. Halfas himself again discusses the Neoplatonist expression of regard for Indian wisdom. Does the long duration of a pro-India view not indicate that it must have been quite widely or deeply situated in Greek intellectual culture? Does one normally state or deliberately point out one's own community's indebtedness? Is there no such thing as local pride, especially in the case of a community like that of the Greeks, that the same historians have depicted as self-conscious for valid reasons? Do the Indians not show the same openness when they give greater credit to the Yavanas or Mlechas for having advanced the manufacture of mechanical devices? Will the Indian's silence about borrowing philosophy from outside may not be conclusive in itself? Does it not at least offer, uh, sorry, while the Indian's silence about borrowing philosophy from outside may not be conclusive in itself, does it not offer at least a possible negative corroboration of what we learn from the Greek sources? Would not taking the Greek statements as true agree with the Greek insistence on openness and history writing? At least until such questions are answered, evaluation of the evidence with comments meaning inadequate, not clear enough, etc. amounts a to explaining away the evidence rather than using it, or b to attaching greater weight to one's highly subjective impressions than to what the statements quite literally and objectively stand for. If suspicion is carried so far in the case of an historical issue, having a reasonably wide body of evidence, it should be extended to all historical research and the enterprise should simply be called off. Would the suspicion or su expectation of more or clearer evidence be not an indication of the double standards in research? How many instances are there in which our historians or Indologists have suspended the possibility of seeing foreign, particularly Greek influence in things Indian, saying, let's have a proof of the importation of a whole complex or context into India. I have not taken a tally, but my impression based on a wide variety of Indological discussions in this particular area suggests 
that segments, fragments, indirect pieces of evidence have been too frequently viewed as sufficient to accept possibilities or probabilities as historical facts. Whether it is mentioned of something like uh, Yavanani in Parnini or Javanika in the dramatical tradition, uh, dramaturgical tradition, uh, the evidence is much smaller, much thinner than all of the things that we see from different traditions here. I am of course not implying that India did not borrow from Greece or from any other civilization for that matter or that Halfas has deliberately applied different standards. He has spared no pains to be objective. The suggestion of my remark is only that even for a researcher like him, there can be blind spots, however narrow or small they may be. Although he tries to determine the hermeneutical situation of all of his important sources of information and is aware of his own hermeneutical situation, there occasionally rises the question of his missing some considerations. The proponents of revealed religion like early Christianity should see an enemy in the Greek type of philosophy and should therefore try to lower the standing of philosophy is understandable. On the Indian side, we see no such reason if Indians were indebted, why should they not preserve traces of, of, of this particular phenomenon. Note also that the references to the details of contacts between Indian wise men and early Greek philosophers like Socrates indicate that not many precise details or authentic amplifications of the statements made by the Indian wise men were known. Such is usually the case with pieces of old information or with pieces of information culled from old sources that have gone out of currency. In other words, it is not justifiable to cast doubts on the strength of such pieces as evidence by saying that they are vague and are not sufficiently detailed. That such pieces of evidence exist precariously and occur with the detail Indian when specification to the extent of Oriental would have sufficed indicates that the information contained in them was older and to that extent a better pointer to historical truth. To come to my final quote on, the to on this particular part of the essay, Halfa says, story of Socrates and the Indian in Athens. This tale can be traced back to Aristoxenus of Tyrant, a contemporary of Alexander. The Indian does not know what philosophy is. He asks Socrates what kind of activity he is pursuing as a philosopher. When Socrates responds that he is studying problems of human life, the Indian laughs and says, that it is impossible to understand human affairs while ignoring the divine. It seems likely that Aristotelian, Aristoxenus, who, was, who also had Pythagorean connections, introduced the story shortly after Alexander's Indian campaign as a device for criticizing the Socratic idea of philosophy. End of quotation. Since Halfas does not refer to any other scholar in making the last observation, it probably originates with him. In it, he suggests that Aristoxenus had an ulterior motive, a subtext in mind, when the story entered the text. However, in historical explanations and explorations, motive-based explanations should be the last resort and a researcher offering them must show that there is a textual basis for the motive. Otherwise, such explanations amount to disposing of inconvenient evidence by reading whatever one wishes to read in them. There remains no constraint, an observance of which may make Halfas' statement more acceptable than any uh, that anyone else can make. Also, if they are not to be tied, that is, the motives are not to be tied to the wording of a text, why start with the text at all? Even without reading the wording of a text, in fact, even without acknowledging that there exists a textual piece of evidence, one could then raise a possibility and dispose of that possibility, possibility simply by saying that one does not think that the possibility exists. In the case of the particular piece of evidence, further questions may also be asked. Why did Aristoxenus need a story to criticize the Socratic idea of philosophy? Could he have not directly criticized that idea or stated his difference given the Greek insistence on freedom of speech? 
Why must he be understood as introducing the story shortly after Alexander's campaign? All these details of the uh, consideration of the evidence are not really supported. The resistance to admitting the possibility of Indian influence may partly be due to the sense of certainty regarding the dates of Greek philosophers and the almost complete lack of certainty regarding the lifetimes of early Indian philosophers. With one chronological end uncertain and with the possibility of interpolations in text present to some extent, a researcher naturally tends to depend on what appears more, more settled. However, Kartunen, other person who is one of the best scholars of uh, India and Greek relations that we have, states at some length, how many of the famous Greek accounts cannot be looked upon as unalloyed history? The mixture of fiction and history attributed to them uh, br uh, brings them very close to similar Indian texts in spirit. One then begins to wonder if the priority assigned to them is truly justified to the Greek text. It may be beneficial to recall that throughout this discussion, I have not maintained that the Greeks borrowed the idea of philosophy from the Indians or that they were inspired to invent philosophy because of what they had learned from the Indians. I am also not questioning the accuracy of scholars' uh, translations, interpretations of the sources on which the reconstruction of Greek attitudes, society, etc. is based. I am simply not competent to engage in either of the indicated activities. What I am saying is that even when one avoids the topmost level of conclusion and the bottommost level of primary evidence, the course of discussion on the matter of Greek borrowing of Indian philosophy does not appear even. I sense an imbalance with different expectations being entertained in the case of evidence of Indian borrowing and the evidence of Greek borrowing. As a person who cannot check the dependability of the Greek sources, translations, the frame created by historians of Greece to make sense of the evidence, etc., I will be satisfied with the negative conclusion that the priority of the Greek philosophical tradition has not been proved. Given the counter cons considerations I have raised, however, two other positive conclusions seem more likely to me in the present state of our knowledge. A, the Greeks were honestly giving credit to the Indians and possibly the Egyptians in the statements in our sources. And B, the Greek-Indian interaction is so old and the evidence of it uh, that has been preserved is so spotty that we should change our model to thinking, sorry, to model to taking both of them as the starting point until new evidence warrants abandonment of the model. <clears throat> As someone keeping one eye on my own hermetic situation, I should note that much of the imbalance could come from the practical reality that there have been very few Indian scholars working with primary sources on the Greek tradition. <clears throat> then there have been Western scholars who consider the Greek tradition as part of their own tradition. And therefore, some questions that could occur to an outsider have not probably been asked with respect to the evidence on the Greek, Greek side. Um, in uh, India, since 1972, I have been urging the Patshalas to start the teaching of Greek and Latin. Um, I have uh, uh, pointed out that although Indo-European linguistics has one of the uh, most glorious achievements of human uh, you know, uh, intellectual endeavor in the last 150 or 200 years, India has not produced a single Indo-Europeanist of international stature, which, which are, should be very troubling things. A similar, uh, over the, the, a similar overall impression I get from accounts such as Kartunin's. Researchers who approach the issue of early Indo-Greek relations, especially in the area of philosophy, tend to reject the possibility of give and take or of Indian influence on Greek philosophy for relatively minor di di divergences of detail on the Greek side 
while subscribing to problematic generalizations on the Indian side. I do not think this is in general a matter of prejudice or bias. In the tradition one is closer to, one is naturally aware of subtle differences and hence when a comparison is called for, one tends to emphasize the difference. Professional specialists need to be more sympathetic and receptive to the writings of outside scholars, to quote a recent name, Thomas McEvilly, even if it turns out that these outside scholars occasionally lack some information on recent research or commit occasional errors of translation. I am not implying that there actually have been errors. The remark I have made about the possibility that the Indian tradition may actually deserve priority or the possibility that the Greek and Indian traditions may receive a more justifiable treatment if both are jointly treated as the earliest accessible starting points for the history of philosophy or for the history of philosophy taking shape in Indo-European languages. This uh, entertaining of two possibilities connects this essay to some relatively recent writings of Professor Johannes Bronckhorst. I say relatively recent because Bronckhorst is a prolific writer. I would not be surprised if within a few years he will overtake the late Jan Honda in the number of publications to his credit. Uh, I, I pub went through a volume published in honor of Jan Honda when he was 60 years old and there were 560 publications to his credit. <coughs> I wish Johannes good luck. <coughs> His, uh, he publishes faster than I can manage to read. His own reading is vast. His publications frequently save me the trouble of compiling bibliographies on specific topics. His command of the languages, Sanskrit, etc., central to his researches is excellent. He usually writes very clear prose, uh, employing dialogue style, in, uh, indirect dialogue style, in very nicely in his publications. In the translations he publishes, I usually do not have differences of opinion beyond what one would expect in the case of ancient texts occasionally having problematic passages. However, he as he already knows, there is a rare research paper of his with the historical conclusions of which I find myself in agreement. His Why Is There Philosophy in India? is a particularly flawed publication in terms of methodology in my view. Confining myself to the present purpose, I can summarize Bronckhorst's thesis thus. Rationality as a force changing intellectual culture and through that culture other manifestations of culture such as scientific, social and political arose only once in history. The place was Greece. It arrived in India after Alexander's attempted invasion or partially successful invasion of Northwest India. The Greeks came into contact with the Buddhists. The Sarvastivadins among the Buddhists used the new awareness to order their Abhidharma lists. A discussion of those lists between the Sarvastivadins on the one hand and other Buddhist schools and non-Buddhist schools on the other gradually gave rise to the institution of philosophical debates as distinct from seemingly debate-like conversations on mystic symbols, etc. that one finds in the Upanishads and later it gave rise to systematic philosophy. Such a thesis has naturally led scholars of Indian philosophy to ask directly or indirectly what does Bronckhorst mean by rationality in the present context? And in this essay uh, that is uh, published separately as a Honda lecture, Bronckhorst says rationality is freedom to question anything one wants to question. Uh, rationality is freedom to engage in debates and challenge authority. Uh, these are the two definitions he expressly states at various points in the essay. One may quarrel with this uh, definition, but if he has made them explicit, we have to follow them in evaluating his, his writing. Now, uh, one thing, 
as I have remarked to Bronkhorst more than once, and once even in publication, is that he has a tendency to be carried away by a new possibility that occurs to him. And then in that enthusiasm for that possibility, he ignores or just doesn't take into account any evidence that could be possibly pointing in the opposite direction. And the present essay also, uh, I said to him once, and I have written this, that is, uh, you go for a fly of evidence, ignoring the evidence of an uh, elephant of evidence. <laughs> so this is uh, what, what happens frequently in my view. He may consider it a, a, a sort of unfair characterization. Anyway, uh, I will summarize the later part of my uh, presentation to save time. Um, first of all, um, at all crucial points in this essay, Bronkhorst um, doesn't really give us concrete textual evidence. For example, he says the uh, Sarvastivadin Buddhists or Buddhists in general became aware of the Greek institution of debate and philosophizing and rationality uh, through the text Milinda Pahya. And then he says, but in Milinda Pahya itself, there is no evidence of such a precise interaction. So I'm not talking about the text, but I'm talking about the role the text played in Buddhist society. How do you decide what role the text played without referring to the details of the text? Um, if you look at the Abhidharma literature that has survived, uh, I think you have to recognize that Abhidharma is an indirect commentary on the sermons and other accounts preserved in earlier Buddhist tradition. I once, while talking with Dan in uh, Warsaw, I, I said, for me, Abhidharma is Buddhist Mimamsa. That is, uh, you distill the ideas crucial for understanding the Buddha's teachings in various spheres, um, ethical teachings, religious teachings, uh, teachings in the field of yoga, teachings for uh, discipline within the Sangha, you try to extract the crucial ideas and systematize them. Does a hermeneutic activity like that take place without having some sense of rationality? Don't the divergences we see in different Abhidharma lists show either the institution of debate existing there and people disagreeing with each other, or a confused state of the Buddhist mind in general. They could not make up uh, uh, their mind as to what the Buddha actually wanted to concentrate on, teach as his main teaching. Uh, such possibilities must be taken into account, whether uh, you consider a particular Abhidharma text or in any other Abhidharma text, because they, as evidence, are collectively relevant to us. Uh, the, uh, Many other things in this particular essay are troubling. It is, uh, for me, uh, another indication of uh, enthusiasm for a particular possibility that has gone too far. One also has to take into account what the so-called Brahmanical literature of the earlier period indicates. We have many different classifications in Brahmanical tradition, starting right from the Rigveda. Even if you t ignore the later parts of the Rigveda, there are a number of uh, uh, conce uh, concepts that are presented as pairs or groups. And there is clearly uh, a direction of presenting a philosophical whole. This, the, or different wholes, you might say. And these different uh, wholes may not always given our resources, uh, be reconcilable. But they are there, and within themselves, one can see uh, a great deal of interest in classifying, analyzing, debating. Uh, also, the Upanishadic debates, it's true. They are not exactly like Greek debates. Philosophical issues are not being discussed. But the myths and symbol, the, the mythic symbols or religious symbols that are being discussed by Yadni Valkya, Gargi, or whoever you can uh, think of, have to have some intellectual background before they can be discussed in this way. Obviously, both parties know 
what is involved. And both parties attach a great deal of value to uh, being honest to yourself. That's why satya is so frequently emphasized. And satya has been given what we would now call magical power, magical potency of some kind, that if Gargi uh, is dishonest enough uh, to uh, express one view to Yadnivalkya, when in, inside of uh, her heart she knows the other view to be true, her head will fall off. And this kind of uh, emphasis on being honest, being open, how can that be accounted for if you don't have any serious commitment to debating? Even if the objects of debate, the items of debate, may be different from what you find in the Greek tradition. How, as Professor Cardona incidentally has pointed out, how can you account for Panini? Bronckhorst's uh, uh, response is to try to date Panini later than uh, the, the rise of Buddhism, which is one of the most unconvincing things. That is, uh, we don't know how old Panini was, but uh, there is really no reason to date Panini later than um, the rise of most uh, Buddhist schools. So there are a number of difficulties, and uh, I don't think that this particular uh, piece is strong in its logic. Its logic is as weak as uh, I say toward the conclusion of my paper. And suppose if I want to say that all the famous German philosophical names I know of begin with H, Herder, Hegel, Habermas, Husserl, <laughs> okay, Halfas, you know. And if I say Germany has that, we have a poem in Sanskrit, <laughs> you know, Bhattir Nashto, Bharavish Chapi Nashta, Vikshur Nashto, Bhimase no Pinashta, Bhukkundoham, Bhupatistvam Charajan, Bhabha Pangtau, Antakasam Pravishtaha. You know, this poet who has gone to a patron to get some money composes this clever poem. He says, Look here, all these people whose names began with Bha, you know, Bhatti, Bharavi, Bhikshu, Bhimasena, they have died. You are uh, I am Bhukkunda, and you are Bhupati. If I die, you are next in line. <laughs> Therefore, you should support me and keep me alive. If I were to say that uh, because we see similar patterns uh, in the, all these names beginning with H and all these names beginning with B, and therefore Germany and India were related somehow, and Germany influenced a 12th century poet in India, that would be uh, far-fetched, obviously ridiculous. I think something similar is happening here. Thank you.